And I'm going to begin Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 to 18. Matthew 16, verses 17 to 18. It says, And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overpower it. Uh, one of the very few shows that we actually watch on TV, and even that we can't watch it every time because sometimes there's times you've got to turn it away, but... There's this show on TV where this fella comes in. It's called a Restaurant Impossible. And he goes into these restaurants that are failing. And he will help them to sort out their finances and their menus and these sorts of things. Well, he went to this restaurant. Many times he goes there. They don't even, they don't know any idea what their numbers are financial-wise. And yet they know he's coming. Sometimes he'll come there and they won't even clean the place up. But they know he's coming. I tell you, I, I may not know how to do the restaurant business, but if I knew the fellow was coming my way in TV camera, I'd make sure the place was clean, right? But at any rate, they, he'll come there, and one of the things he'll help them with is their menu. And many times, they don't have any recipes for things written down at all. So if there's a different cook on a different day, they might cook the some dish some way different. Anyone have you ever been to a restaurant and it's different than the time, last time you were there? Right? So this doesn't even look, relate to it. And so when he's helping them to make recipes, here's what he'll do. I'll have them write down the recipe so that they know the ingredients. But he will also make them take a picture of what it's supposed to look like and put it up there. Because he wants them not only to know what goes into it, but he wants them to have a picture of what it's supposed to look like. And the picture is actually maybe even almost important as the ingredients because... When you put it out, people, even if it doesn't taste exactly the same, at least when they look at it, they're, well, it looks like it's the same stuff anyway. But they have these pictures so you know what something is supposed to look like. Well, tonight we're going to go at five pictures of what the church is supposed to look like. Five different pictures. There are more than five, but five is all the time we have for in these next two or three hours that we have together this evening. I'm kidding about that. I always do. But when it is, there's five pictures we're going to look at tonight of what the church is supposed to look like. I will tell you, there are pictures that people have in the world of the church that aren't accurate pictures. How many know that? They have pictures of the church and they're not accurate pictures of what the church really is. They look upon the church as being some kind of, a, a, you know, a fuddy duddy club or they look upon the church as being... Those are people that uh, uh, the pessimist club because they're always down in the mouth or so that's the way the world wants to put them. You know that they never have any joy. The world will look upon the church and it's sad to say is that sometimes I was talking to a man this past week out on the, out, uh, on the street here not too far away from the church. And I was talking to a man this week and, and uh, uh, he had been here before and, and uh, so I had a chance to talk to him and I, and I didn't know his name and I talked to him and he says... He said that, that uh, he did love the church here. He loved the church here because he said the church wasn't about money. And every other church he'd been to, to him, seemed like it was about money. Now, I will tell you, it is unfortunate that uh, some, especially those of high uh, profile, have seemingly made it seem that way to the culture of the world. And that's a terrible thing. But that's not the true picture of what the true church is or is supposed to be, right? Sometimes we as Christians even can get wrong ideals of the church. There are people who name the name of Christ. And yet, unfortunately, sometimes they don't want to be a part of an assembly or they don't view it as being important to be a part of an assembly. Why? Because it is that they look and they say, well, I can get all the church I need on TV, which is problematic anyway, because I would say about 90% of what's there isn't good representation, unfortunately. About 10% maybe is. Although I don't know, I may be giving it too much of a, of a high number there. But at any rate, they'll say that and they'll say they don't think that they need the church. And maybe they've been done wrong by a church in the past. And so they don't want to be a part of a church in the future. And I, hey, if you've ever been around the church for any length of time, you know that uh, there are people that come to church that aren't glorified yet. And you and I both be those people too, right? And so there can be inaccurate pictures of the church. But we need to get our picture of what the church is and should be, not from uh, uh, the world and not from our own thinking, but from what Scripture says. 
Because how many know the world is pretty much always wrong? How many know even in our own thinking, any of us been wrong before? But the scripture, God is always right. He paints the picture of how things uh, are to be in the true church, those who are believers in his name. And so here we come to Matthew chapter 16. And I only pulled a couple verses out there. I will tell you, this is a fantastic passage. If you read a few verses above this, you will find that this is where Jesus comes to his disciples prior to these verses. And he'll ask his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they'll answer, they'll say back, and there's a whole sermon here, but I won't preach it. But there's a sermon in the three people that he, they say that, the, that men say, in other words, that the world says Jesus is. And they say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist, of course, had been beheaded. Some thought he was like John the Baptist. Or it might even be John the Baptist risen from the dead. Herod thought that, certainly. And Jesus and John the Baptist, you know, some people think that John the Baptist had this message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus came with all love and never talked about repentance. Read your Bible. Jesus had the same message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Sometimes we don't like to hear the word repent anymore. But how many know? Apart from repentance, there can be no salvation. Because if you don't acknowledge your sin, you won't acknowledge the Savior. And so here it is, is that some said Jesus was John the Baptist. Why? John the Baptist told it like it was, no matter who it was, and Jesus was similar. He told the truth. Remember, they would approach Jesus, call him good teacher. Why? Because they knew that he spoke the truth, no matter what the situation or circumstance or the position of who may be before him. So some said John the Baptist. And then others said, well, maybe Elijah. Remember, Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire in the Old Testament. And they thought that he might be, a, perhaps some would say even Elijah maybe come back. Or certainly someone in the spirit and power of Elijah. And when you go to the Old Testament, Elijah is known for doing a lot of miracles. A lot of miracles. And how many know Jesus did a lot of miracles too? He would go and he'd heal the sick and he'd raise the dead. And he'd give sight to the blind and make the lame to leap. And uh, would cure the leper. I tell you, Jesus, he would cast demons out of the demon possessed. So like Elijah, Jesus too was a miracle worker. But how many know, Jesus is much more than just a truth teller. Much more than just a miracle worker, right? He is those things, but he's more. And then the third thing they said, some say maybe you're Jeremiah. Now if you know about Jeremiah in the Old Testament, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Even though he would bring words that would be harsh. When you read them, they are harsh. They sound harsh. They seem harsh. But that's what people would need to hear, but they didn't want to hear. And I mentioned this on Sunday, uh, but it's worth mentioning over and over again. The world, what they need to hear isn't what they uh, want to hear. They want to hear how great they are. What they need to hear is repent and put trust in Christ, right? And so here it is, as some said Jeremiah, because, and the reason why isn't just that Jeremiah confronted a sinful culture and sinners at large, as did Jesus, he confronted sin and sinners as well, but Jeremiah also would weep. And you know, Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He would weep when he would see the condition of those who would reject him. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept at Lazarus' tomb, seeing what sin does to the human condition. Because before there was sin, there was no death. That's one reason why, and I don't want to get on a tangent here, but back, there are those who say, even those who name the name of Christ, who will say, they will say, I don't say, they say, and the Bible doesn't say, but they say, that it does sound important to believe in Adam and Eve, a literal first couple in the Garden of Eden. Well, I say it is because Scripture says it is. And how do you, one of the many pitfalls is, how do you account for death? If there was no sin, because the soul that sinned shall die. If there hadn't been sin, there wouldn't be death. But there is sin, and it has infiltrated the human race from Adam all the way down to our time, hasn't right. there? And so here it is, is that they say, Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're Elijah. And then he comes to them and says, but who do you say that I am? And what does Peter do? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the verses we read come into play. Jesus says in response to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he says, You are Peter, and upon this rock, it's a play, Peter, Petros, in the Greek means rock. 
And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. King James will say the gates of hell, gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overpower it. Now, notice the word church is used here, isn't it? There's only two places. Now, in the epistles, the letters of Paul and of others, the word church is used. But in the Gospels, only the book of Matthew uses this word for the church two times. One here and one in Matthew 18, speaking of church discipline. And the word for church is ecclesia. I've mentioned it before. It comes from two Greek words. Ek means out and kaleo is a word that means called. And if you are a believer in Christ, you're a called out one. What does Romans chapter 8 says? Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. How many are thankful that uh, if God had waited for us in and of our own strength to call upon him, we'd all be lost and undone. Another old song, you know I love the old song, says, You, speaking to God, you did not wait for me to call out to you. But you let me hear your voice calling me. How many are thankful if you're a Christian, if you're a believer? You're a called out one. Called out from what? Called out from the world system to be sure. Called out from sin to be sure. But also called out from a destiny of death and of hell to one of life in heaven. And how many are thankful for that? And so here it is. Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you. Man hasn't revealed this to you, but my father's revealed this to you. And upon this rock, the rock was not Peter as a person. The rock is the revelation of who Jesus is. Jesus is the cornerstone. No man is the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. So this revelation of who Jesus is, upon that, he will build his church. And then he says this, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not prevail against it, or will not overpower it. And if you've looked up here, you notice the first picture we're going to look at tonight of five is the church is an army. You say, how do you get that from this picture? Most people, just because we read the Bible too fast, when you think the gates of hell won't prevail against the church, you think about, and, and I used to think this way too, that means that the gates of hell are coming against the church, but we're going to stand up against them and prevail. No, I mean, we're... Boxed in on every side that the gates of hell won't prevail against us. We'll whack them all here and whack them all there, right? You ever play that game, right? Where you have to whack them. But that's not the picture. It doesn't say here that they're advancing. The picture here is that the people of God are advancing. The gospel is advancing. The called out ones are advancing. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, we're on the march. We're on the move as the people of God. How many are thankful, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. Not because of our power, but because of His promise. The gates of hell will not prevail against the people of God, the army of God. I will tell you, there are some uh, that throughout the century, some even, how many ever heard that hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers? Marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus, going on before Christ the royal captain leads against the foe. Onward in the battle, see his banners go. All were Christian soldiers marching as to war. There are some that have wanted to take that hymn out of the hymn books over the course of time because they don't like any military talk when you talk about the church. Because the church is supposed to be gentle and meek and mild. You know, a lot of people describe Jesus that way too. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Well, now, was Jesus the kindest person? Is he the one that would walk in the fruit of the Spirit? Better than any of us ever will, to be sure. But do understand, there were times when gentle Jesus, meek and mild, would turn the tables over in the temple, fashion a whip, and drive them out of the temple. There were times when gentle Jesus, meek and mild, would say, woe unto the religious, religious leaders, and tell them that if they didn't quit, quit uh, leading little ones astray, that God would it be better for them if they had a millstone hung around their neck and they're hurled into the sea. How many know that's not exactly the words of some, uh, for lack of a better word, some wimpy Jesus, right? And here it is, is that uh, and this military picture of the church, again, we're not to be militant in the sense of, uh, uh, of, of being rude or being angry or certainly not crude or any of those things. But I will tell you this, there is a battle that is afoot. And when you read in Ephesians chapter 6, 
When Paul speaks of the armor of God, the armor of God is for the people of God that we might have the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the enemy and the helmet of salvation and our feet shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the belt of truth around our waist and that we would have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the living God. How many know this military picture is more than one place in Scripture that we are, I don't know if this one's in the hymn book, but we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. Anybody ever heard that song? I won't sing it all through because it'd go up too high and then I'll mess it up. But at any rate, we're soldiers in the army of the Lord. You and I were called to be that as the church. And aren't you thankful that when it is that the light of truth, the light of truth will not be dispelled by the darkness for just in speaking of Christ, so too it is of his gospel, that the light goes forth and the darkness cannot overpower it or could not uh, comprehend it, as the King James word, but it can't overtake it, can't overpower it. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful? Now, again, some of your translations there say hell and some will say Hades. The Greek word there is Hades, and it means the place of the dead. And what does that mean for the Christian? It means this. That even if it is, the worst thing that this world would have to throw at us seemingly would be the taking of our natural life. But how many know if you are in Christ, the gates of the dead won't prevail against us for we have a risen Savior. And if we have a risen Savior, we know that we too shall rise and be with Him forever. Paul says this in his epistle to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. He likens there as well. Again, there's three verses I've mentioned already that speak of the church and of believers as an army. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, Paul says that the Christian is to be as a good soldier that, yes, will suffer hardship, but that also is not so entangled in the affairs of this life. Like a soldier as to he can't be all entangled in affairs other than the purpose at hand. And how many are thankful? This world talks about purpose a lot. Even in Christian circles, talks about purpose a lot. And unfortunately, sometimes it has little or anything to do with scriptural things. But aren't you thankful? If you're a believer, there is a purpose. There is a point to life. And that is to glorify the God who shed his blood for you and made you alive in Christ Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? So the church is an army. And you may look and say, well, hmm, hmm, I don't know if it's me as part of the army and some others I know as part of the army. What, what kind of army we got? What kind of chance do we got? Where, can I tell you, if it is that you are part of the army of the Lord, no matter how the world may esteem the church, oh, I tell you, it is the place that Jesus has promised there be victory in his church. Why? Because the gates of hell won't overpower, not because of our strength or our munitions, but because of him and his strength and his power, his spirit and his word. Aren't you thankful for that? So here it is. The church is an army, an army. And I'm thankful it depends upon the, our conquering and our victory is based upon what he has done and who he is, a revelation of who he is. So the church, a picture to have in your mind of the church, not chicken parmesan. I'm not talking about recipes now, but it's a scriptural picture of the church is an army. And how many are thankful to be enlisted in that army by the power of God and for his glory. Amen. Look here next. Here's another picture. And this may seem to be a, a little bit of a distinction, but all these are biblical pictures for the church. Next picture is children of the father. First John chapter five, verses one to two. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. Talks about us being children of God if we've been born again. We did some time ago some thoughts from 1 John with regard to life and being born again. And John is used by God in his gospel as well as in his epistle to bring this ideal of being a Christian as being a child of God. Someone who is born again. And he uses it in John chapter 3 verse 3. Jesus said to Nicodemus. Unless you are born again. You will not see the kingdom of heaven. How many are thankful. If you know him. You've been born again. The old things passed away. And all things becoming new. John chapter 1 verses 11 to 13. Says of Jesus. That he came into his own. But his own received him not. 
but to as many as would receive them to them. He gave the power, some translators say the right, to become the children of God, even to those that believe on his name, who were born not of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of the will of God. How many are thankful if you believe in Jesus Christ, you've been born again. That those who rejected him, not born again, but those who receive him are born again. And it's good to be born again, isn't it? Look here as well. First John chapter three, verse one will say this. Behold, what manner of love the father has lavished upon us. Some translations will say bestowed, but the word picture there in Greek is how many are thankful that God just doesn't bestow as far as I can know. Yeah, but he lavishes. Aren't you thankful that his love is lavished? Right? When he spread out his arms open on the cross, that's lavish love, isn't it? Behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we, that is believers, should be called the children of God. That is the sons and the daughters of God. Isn't it good to be born again? You know, there are people that will say, uh, in fact, there's an old song and, and uh, uh, it's usually saying uh, around the Christmas time of year and it says, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our Father, brothers all are we. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And I like some of those words if understood correctly, but I will tell you, there are some people that have the thought that every man, woman, boy, and girl is a son or a daughter of God. Well, in a general sense, insofar as no one would have life apart from His Almighty Hand, that's true. But as far as spiritually and eternally speaking, you are not a son or daughter of God unless you're in Christ Jesus. You've not been born again unless your hope and your trust is in Jesus alone. You don't have spiritual life. You might have natural life, but you don't have spiritual life. Most of us think of this idea that people are alive and that they need to put their trust in the Lord. Well, that is true. People are alive physically and they need to put their trust in the Lord. But scripture says that those who haven't been born again are dead in trespasses and sins. And they need to be born again and brought to being alive. How many can remember? I hope that you can and I hope that you haven't lost that wonder of when it was you didn't know Christ. And then one day things you may have not understood or perhaps things you maybe you understood but you rejected for whatever reason. But on that grand and glorious day when you repented of sin and by His grace put trust in Him for salvation, there was a newness of life. How many are thankful for that? I tell you, no greater picture could it be of a change in somebody's life. And by a change, I don't just mean a change insofar as that not doing some of the things they used to do and doing some of the things that they hadn't been doing, although God does that in our lives over the period of time. But a newness of life, a new quality of life, that something was different, not only on the outside, but more importantly, on the inside when you come to know Christ. Born again, a son of God, a daughter of God. How many are thankful for that? To be children of the Most High God. You know, I, I sometimes, I don't mention this very often, but you know, every service that we have, for the most part, I might have missed one incidentally, but I don't think that I ever have. But at the close of our service, no matter what might be the subject matter, because you never know when there might be someone that might be convicted, perhaps they were a false convert, and now they realize they're not a genuine convert to Christ. Or there might be someone that, that has never before really uh, had the Spirit convict them and then to put trust in Jesus as the Savior. But there's a time in our prayer time of basically what you might call an invitation. Now, I will tell you, search in Scripture in vain for a what we might call a sinner's prayer. You don't find saying repeat this prayer after me as we oftentimes do in our day and time. And so I struggle sometimes with how to exactly do that sort of thing. But if you notice, I will always say, if it is God is convicting you of Christ as Savior and of your sin, then come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. That's confessing that you're a sinner. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. He's the only one who could. Then it says, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, uh, that make me your child. Why? Because if you're, you have repented of sin and put trust in him, you'll be a child of God and be born again. 
How many are thankful to be children of the Most High God if indeed you are in Christ? So here it is, is that, that John presents this picture of the church. We are God's children. We're God's children. How many of you got children? How many of you have ever been children? That's everybody. <laughs> Can I tell you? When you see your child and you see your children, even if they've upset you, even if they have done wrong, even if it is that at various ages they might not do as maturely as you would like them, how many love them and love them and love them? Right? How many of you have godly parents that maybe you were a prodigal in a sense? And yet they kept praying for you. I know that wouldn't be the case for everybody in here. But that's the case for some in here. And aren't you thankful that your earthly parents still love you even when you're disappointed? Even when you're disrespected? Even when you did what you knew you shouldn't have done? And yet still, now I know there are earthly parents that do terrible things too. I understand that. But many would know parents that have loved no matter what it would have been the course of things to happen. How many are thankful Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much does he, being God, know how to give the Holy Spirit, Luke will say, unto his children? Aren't you thankful that our Heavenly Father loves us? Aren't you thankful that if you indeed are called out one, a picture of who you are is a child of God? And when we come together as a church, we're the children of God, praising our Heavenly Father, through Jesus the Son, in the power of the Spirit. And isn't that good to be a child of God? It's such a wonderful privilege that we did not earn, but that was paid for by His precious blood, that we might be adopted into the family of God, born again by the power of the Spirit and the truth of His Word. You know, the disciples in Matthew chapter 18, as they often would do, uh, they came and they asked Jesus, Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Anybody ever notice that when you read through the Gospels? So many times the disciples at the time. Now they got it later on. Which there's a sermon there. Jesus told them. You don't know exactly all this right now. I can only tell you so much right now. But there'll come a time when the Spirit will bring it all back to you. How many are thankful that the Spirit did just that? But there'll be many times when the disciples were kind of clueless about what was going on. And they were wanting to know who's going to be the greatest. Isn't that the ideal of this world? Who's going to be the greatest, right? And of course, everybody assumes that I'm the greatest, right? Everybody says, not me personally. I mean, everybody thinks themselves are the greatest, right? The greatest one they've ever seen is when they look in the mirror, right? They know, they know that they are, even when they do wrong, they know, hey, it's not as bad as somebody else. And when they do right, there's other people who wouldn't have done that. I mean, it's just, they, all kind of ways we find as humans to praise ourselves, unfortunately. But here it is, is that they were saying, who's going to be the greatest? And you know what Jesus did? He called out a little child. And he bid the little child to come unto him. And what did he say in Matthew 18, 1 to 3? He says, the kingdom of heaven is such as this. As a little child. A little child by simple faith to believe in Christ. To repent of sin and to be born again. How many are thankful for a picture of the church as the children of God? Look here next. The third of five pictures. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13 is members of a body. Verse 12 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians says this. For even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body while the Jews are Greeks, while the slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Members of a body. That's what the church is. Any of you ever hurt one of the members of your own body? I mean your physical members? I remember I was out walking one day and I was going down the bus ramp and I went there and some girl that was in the fifth grade, she had one of these uh, uh, backpacks. It was on wheels. And she was off talking to somebody and her backpack got on the wheels and went out in front of me. And there was some student I needed to watch. I could still tell you her name, but I won't tell you her name was Victoria. But I was coming, I was coming back. None of you know her last name. I didn't give the last name. Should I get? No, I won't get that. 
But uh, this was some years ago, and I was looking back, and I had to keep an eye on her out on that bus ramp because I actually had to break up a fight with her one time, and it was just, it was something awful. So I had to keep a close eye on her. So I'm watching her, and I ain't watching the backpack. This girl's talking to her friend. She ain't watching her backpack. And her backpack got in front of me, and I took a tumble. And I landed, and some of you remember my shoulder was hurt. Oh, it was hurt so bad. And then workmen's come. Bless their hearts. I never had to deal with them before and hope I don't never have to deal with them no more. But uh, it was forever before I actually got to see a doctor. And by that time, my shoulder had frozen up. Have you ever had a frozen shoulder? If, I'm not talking about cold shoulder. I mean, frozen shoulder. <laughs> when your shoulder freezes up, that you, you just you can't hardly move it. And I couldn't hardly move it. And I'm right-handed. It was my right shoulder. And I didn't know. I tell you, only one member was hurting. But, oh, my whole body felt it. Anybody ever had that happen, right? One part of your body hurts and the whole body was hurting. It wasn't working and that caused a problem. Sometimes, thank the Lord, I had physical therapy on that. And the Lord's touch and Still, I can't go quite as high as I used to before, but it don't hurt no more to do regular stuff. I'm glad about that. Sometime later, I hurt my knee. You say, how did you hurt your knee? I don't know how I hurt my knee. That's the way you know you're getting old. You hurt yourself and you don't even know how you did it. <laughs> right? Anybody ever done that before? Right? You're like, I, that, I hurt. I don't even know what happened. Right? I don't know how I did it, but I hurt my right knee. And so then I'll adjust. And thankfully, it's much better than what it used to be. And I appreciate your prayers for that. But I hurt my right knee, and then when I adjust to, to walk in different, so as to take pressure off that knee, anybody ever adjusted the way you walked, and then all of a sudden it messes up something that wasn't messed up? Right? So the members of the body are important. In fact, if you look throughout Paul's description here of the church as a body, he says that the members that seem to be not as apparent or not as, as out front not as noticeable, not as honorable, it would seem, are actually sometimes perhaps the more vital members. And what he means there is the internal organs. How many know, Paul talks there, he mentions the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And the knee can't say to the shoulder, that's my analogy, that I don't need you. We can't say, and the members, like our internal organs, you can't even see them, but they perform the most vital functions of all. You can go without your arm and your leg, maybe, but internally, you need those things to work. And the reason I mention this is because of this. All of us as Christians are parts of the body of Christ. He is the head and he alone is the head. But how am I thankful to be a member of the body of Christ? I'm thankful when we pray for Pastor James. I've never met him. Maybe I'll meet him in this life. I'll meet him in the next. And, and be able to, I tell you, say, we were praying for you, brother. And, uh, you know. Uh, and, and these other ones that I don't know them other than their name and what descriptions we get here. But aren't you thankful that God's body, members of God's body are across the face of this globe? And you're a part of that if you're a part of the church of God. You're a member of the body. You're a called out one. You're a born again child of God if you're in Christ. And aren't you thankful to be a member of the body of Christ? I tell you, you read in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I won't tell you all about it. But 1 Corinthians, there was a lot of bad stuff happening in that church. A lot of bad stuff that needed to be corrected. I mean, some serious stuff. I mean, people that were uh, intoxicated at the communion table. People having improper relations of those kinds of relations. And, they were, and there were all kinds of things that were happening that needed to be corrected in that church. But do you know at the very beginning, read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he'll say that he had heard before. Now, he does address those things because those things are wrong and they needed to be addressed. Because how do we know the church ought to be living different than the world? Right? Yeah. Not by way of works righteousness, but if you've been redeemed, you want to please the one who redeemed you, not the one you've been redeemed from. Yeah. Right? And so here it is, is that, but, but Paul, before he addresses those things in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said, I hear that there are factions among you. Some say I'm of Apollo, some say I'm of Peter, some say I'm of Paul, some say, I'm, but isn't it Christ who has died for you? Christ is the unifying factor. And here when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, we are all members of the body of Christ. Therefore, we have something to do with one another. And aren't you thankful to be a member of the body of Christ? And that means you have a function in the body of Christ. There's no spare parts to the body of Christ. 
Now that doesn't mean everybody will be the, as I've often said, your thing might not be my thing and my thing might not be your thing, but everybody ought to have something that you know that you want to do to serve the Lord and to bless the Lord and to praise the Lord and to be about the Lord's business. How many are thankful to be a member of the body of Christ? And so here it is, it says here that we are that indeed, that is a picture of the church that we would be part of the body of Christ. And we would be members one of another. You know, this world, anyone ever heard somebody get on there, some politician or something, and they'll say, or some even beauty pageant star, and they'll say, I want world peace, unity, unity, unity. Why can't we all just come together? Unity, unity. Anybody ever hear that? Can I tell you, in the world's terms, those are empty, empty nothings. And it may sound harsh for me to say that, but I will tell you, uh, the unity, if this world ever even achieved unity apart from Christ, if it did, you know what it would do? It would build a tower of Babel that God would bring down. The only true unity is in Christ. Everything else is dog eat dog and they're number one and everybody will step on everybody else. But only in Christ. And can I tell you, in Christ, look at the big Jews and Greeks. Apart from Christ... They're, they had nothing. I mean, they were like at odds with one another. Slave and free. They would have nothing to do with one another apart. But in Christ, how many are thankful? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And we become members of the body of Christ. And members indeed of one another. And can I tell you too, when one member hurts, we care for that part of the body of Christ. For we should. Why? Because Christ the head does. Look here next. The fourth picture out of five. John chapter 10 verses 14 to 16. Jesus says this. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own. And my own know me. Even as the father knows me. And I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. Which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will hear my voice. And they will become one flock. With one Shepherd. Can I tell you, I remember there's a, and I've used this illustration in a different message before, but it works here as well. There's a famous uh, pastor or church leader, very well known. And he said that we should, but he's more into leadership is what he says he's into than pastoral concerns. And he will say this, he'll say, he, he actually told the interviewer one time, he says, I've never owned sheep. I don't see sheep in my everyday life. Says, and most people I talk to don't know anything about sheep either. He, and he's an American. He says, I think we need to do away with this picture of the sheep and the shepherd. And have it be like the, 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 the pastor should be known as a shepherd, but a CEO. So that says, we see lots of companies in the... The pastor ought to be considered like a CEO over a company. Well, if it's all the same to him, and even if it ain't, I'll stick with the sheep and the shepherd. Because the body of Christ, the church, is not just some company. We're not shareholders with our individual priorities and worldly motivations, or even with numeric considerations. If we are a child of God, we are sheep. Of the one true shepherd. And it's good to be a sheep of the sheepfold of God. Can I tell you. When you read here by the way. This, this little analogy that I just used. Is not far astern. Not only from this picture of sheep and shepherd. But from the whole context here. If you read. Uh, this is actually. Uh, John chapter 10. The, the context for this goes back to the beginning of John chapter 9. And I preached on it some time ago. But John chapter 9 is Jesus healing the, the man born blind. You remember that? Jesus comes across this blind man. The disciples say, who sinned? Him or his parents that he's blind? You remember that blind man? Jesus healed more than one blind man. But this was the particular one. And Jesus says, well, not Jesus wasn't saying that the man hadn't sinned. That his parents hadn't sinned. All of sin had fallen short of the glory of God. But he said it's not because of that particular, any particular thing there. That this blindness has come upon him. But that the glory of God might be revealed. Jesus ends up healing the man of his blindness. And what do the religious leaders of the day do? Bad religious leaders. You know what they did? They came to the man and they says, Who healed you? He's healing you on the Sabbath. So this man 
in the name of Jesus, he came and he, he healed me and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I was born blind. And everybody said, yeah, this man was born blind. His parents say he was born blind. But they didn't want to, even his parents didn't want to stick their necks out. They said, you need to ask him because it had already went out that if anybody said Jesus was the Messiah, they'd be kicked out of the synagogue. And so these are bad religious leaders here. They come against Jesus. They do end up kicking that man out of the synagogue. And, they, and of course, they scorn Jesus. They wanted to kill Jesus. But at the end of John chapter 9, the man who had been blind really got his sight. And I don't mean his natural sight. At the end of John chapter 9, he's worshiping Jesus. And Jesus receives that worship. As I mentioned many times, Jesus received worship. That's one of the proofs that he was God. If he wasn't God, that would be blasphemy. I tell you, you come up here and worship me, I'm going to tell you to repent. <laughs> I ain't God. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> you know it too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but uh, but it, it, Jesus received worship. Why? Because he is God. If he hadn't been God, that would have been a simple thing for him to do. But he received worship, and, and this man knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And then Jesus, in John chapter 10, what does he begin to do? But he juxtaposes, he contrasts himself, the true shepherd, the true religious leader, if you will, apart from the false shepherds and the bad religious leaders. And he says, a hireling like these religious leaders, if they see some kind of danger, wolf or whatever coming upon the sheep, they go the other way. Why? Because they're hirelings. The sheep don't belong to them. But if you're the shepherd, and if you're the good shepherd, and Jesus is the good shepherd, you own the sheep. And when this, something happens, you take care of it because you're not a hireling. And that's what Jesus says this. He contrasts himself with these false religious leaders. And Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And he'll go on to say, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. You know, after we're saved, we want to live for the Lord. But never, never, never be under the misunderstanding that somehow to become born again, you lay down your life. He laid down his life for you. And then when you become a child of God, you're filled with the Spirit. And then you want to live your life for him. How many are thankful you do? And so here it is. Is it what trans He said, I laid down my life for the sheep. So to be a sheep, have you ever, I don't know if you've ever seen a sheep or not. I've seen some sheep. At the fair. But when I go down to uh, Alba school. Anybody ever been out Alba way, way? I go out Alba way and I'll look there. I don't see sheep but I see cattle. Now cattle aren't just like sheep. I'm sure of it. I'm not a farming expert. But I do know this. Every now and again I'll see. Not very often but sometimes I'll see somebody go out there to feed them. And you know what they do? They go over there. They know where the food is going to be at. They come because they know it. Hey, when they see that truck coming, that means food is all on the way. And they go there. How many are thankful we have a shepherd that cares for us? He cares for us. He laid down his life for us. And I tell you, there might be some shepherds back in Jesus' day that even though it is that they wanted to care for their sheep, there might be a danger. There might be some kind of thing to come against them that was more powerful than they Something that was better than they, that was stronger than they, but nothing can say that in, in comparison to our good shepherd. He knows how to care for his sheep. If you're a sheep, you do recognize your weakness. And when we gather here as the sheepfold, we recognize our weakness to be sure, but we look unto the good shepherd and there's no weakness in him. Aren't you thankful for that? We as the sheep, we look unto the shepherd and we know that he is the good shepherd. And he laid down his life for us. And notice it says here. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. What does that mean? If you're a child of God, you're sheep and he owns us. Our life is not our own. But it's it belongs to him because we've been bought. Peter will tell us with not with the monies and silvers and treasures of this world and diamonds. But we've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We're his sheep. Used to be an old silly song that we used to sing. I just want to be a sheep. Ba ba. Anybody ever heard that song before? I don't know that it was the most wonderful song, but I will tell you this: How many want to be a recognize you're a sheep of God? Amen. I just want to be a sheep, and we're a sheep of the one true shepherd. Finally, the last one, Ephesians 5, 22, 29 says this. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. 
And all the men said, <laughs> I wasn't turning that way. I didn't want to hear. And I'm going to pretend I didn't recognize any of those voices. For the husband. <laughs> uh, all the men said again. Amen. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. All the men want to say a hearty amen there too, no doubt. But look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Not some ooey, gooey, mushy, worldly, uh, fading kind of love. Not the love this world talks about falling in and out of all the time. But here's the kind of love. Love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And all the ladies said, Amen. 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 Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. I tell you, if you're born again, you're one of the called out ones. You're a child of God. You're part of the sheepfold. You're part of the army. And you're part of the bride of Christ. I would tell you, they had this picture that uh, somebody put on the internet. And I don't know the context, but there was this older man. He was probably 70 or 80 years old. And his wife must have had some infirmity of some kind. I don't know. But you know, there's a picture of him. And he's, he's here. And then it came across just in recent days. And he is there at the side of his car. And... He's feeding his wife because she somehow is, I, I don't know what the issue might be, but she's afflicted in some way. And he's there and, and, and doing that. How many of us, that's just a beautiful picture, right? Can I tell you, no doubt, all of us have seen in the church and outside the church all kinds of, you know, marriage. Do, do you know, people aren't getting married in the, in the way that they used to. Not, not, in the, not even numerically, I mean, because this world's largely, of course, when you define marriage all kinds of different ways, it even loses its definition. And then when it is that, that uh, uh, the world doesn't view those things as sacred or honorable anymore. I tell you, if you've ever been to a secular wedding, so to speak, where it is that it's not done by a minister, it's not done in a Christian perspective, uh, I happened to have studied the vows that one would say, you know, of course, having done that many times myself to, 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 to marry folks and have this sort of thing. But if you ever notice the vows that a secular with taking God, it's just, it's altogether different. I mean, you hear them and because again, I, 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 I've memorized some of them because it's good to memorize a little bit of those so that if you, uh, if you're underneath a, a gazebo and, uh, and the rain's coming down. That was the first way I never did. I'll go into that whole story. But at any rate, it's good to remember some things. But I would tell you, you've seen some husbands and wives treat each other poorly. And some husbands and wives treat each other well, no doubt. But I would tell you, nobody treats their bride like Christ treats his bride. You think of the best example that you may have ever seen. Or the best example to which you would... As a, as, as a husband would want to aspire to. Can I tell you Christ's love for his church is infinite beyond our capacity. And aren't you thankful that he expresses his love. And he expressed his love to us openly when he died upon the cross and bid us to come unto him. Aren't you thankful to be part of the bride of Christ. He loves and cares for his own. And he's sanctifying us. If you read all this, he's sanctifying us by the washing of water with the word to present us uh, without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing that we would be holy. But he's working on his bride and he loves his bride. And aren't you thankful to be a part of his bride? 
So five biblical pictures tonight of the church. The church is an army. Aren't you thankful to be part of the army of the Lord? To be used in His service. And aren't you thankful to be empowered by Him and His Spirit? Instead of going up in this spiritual battle with your own strength, you'd be, and I would be too, be doomed if that were the case. But with Him, the gates of hell won't prevail. Even death itself won't prevail against the believer in Christ. We are children of the Father. And aren't you thankful we do have a loving Heavenly Father above? That we have been born again through Christ. Aren't you thankful as well to be a part of a body, the members of a body, the body of Christ, this local manifestation of the body of Christ and the worldwide body of Christ, those who are believers and united in him. And aren't you thankful to be a sheep with a good shepherd, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep, not like a hireling. Aren't you thankful to be part of the bride of Christ whom he would love and cherish and care for? Amen. I'll close with this picture tonight. I started with food. I'll end with food. And I'm going to eat dinner a little later on tonight. I was disciplined tonight. I had one chicken leg during dinner. One. One. Y'all pray for me. God has blessed me to be able to lose some weight recently. But I want to lose some more. So y'all pray for me. But uh, uh, here it is. Is that You ever seen this uh, on the side of a, of, a, of, a, of a truck going down the road? Ever seen that Big Mac? I like Big Mac. Anybody here like Big Mac? You see that Big Mac and that meat is going over the edge of that bun and the, that sauce is just oozing out of there. And then you go there and it's steaming hot. I mean, they got like steam coming up. You see little pictures of steam things coming up. And with that, to all we pet, I won't go into the song. <laughs> and then you go to the McDonald's and you actually order the thing. And you get it and you're like, Anyone ever done that? That ain't what's on a truck. It's called the Big Mac. I said Big Mac, but this... I ain't so sure. Can I tell you? In the eyes of this world, as I open with tonight, and even in the eyes of some who name the name of Christ, the church picture is askew. But I promise you, the biblical picture is correct. And that's what Christ will bring about through His people. Aren't you thankful? Let's stand our feet tonight. Father, we come before you tonight and we do thank you. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for these biblical pictures of the church. Of people who have been born again. People who, by your grace and for your glory, have repented of sin and trusted in Christ. Lord, if there be any here tonight that has not repented of sin, not trusted in Christ for salvation, they're not a member of the body of Christ. They're not part of his sheepfold. They're not part of his bride. They're not part of his army. They're not a child of God. And I pray tonight they would come in something like this, being convicted of sin and convinced of the Savior. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children tonight, I pray we would not have a skewed picture in our own mind or fall for the skewed picture of this world when it comes to pictures of the church and of the people of God. But then we would look at your word. And we tonight, we rejoice to be a part of your army called to your purpose and power by your spirit. We rejoice tonight to be children of God, not born of the will of man, but of the will of God. We rejoice tonight to be members of a body, a local body here, and of the body of Christ at large. We rejoice tonight to be one of your sheep with a good shepherd, the good shepherd. We rejoice tonight to be part of the bride of Christ. And may we never lose the wonder of that which you have called us to and that which you promise in your word and which you are faithful to perform. Lord, bless our brothers and sisters tonight. Bless them in every way. Lord, you know each and every need and we pray you would minister to them. Encourage our brothers and sisters. Strengthen them in the Lord and in the power of his might, we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray in the power of the spirit that we come. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope your calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of his power extended to all who believe. Amen and amen. 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 God bless